How many of you have gone through a life-changing healthcare experience recently? Big surgery, hospital visit, weird diagnosis. For how many of you, the、um, journey of dealing with that experience went something like this? This is the change curve, or the curve that a、um, psychologist, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, came up with when working with terminally ill patients. Turns out, all people who go through daunting change, healthcare or otherwise, go through these stages. The curve is also known as the change curve, as the five stages of grief curve. And as a recovering consultant, I love the curve. It gives me comfort. Because it has the data, the analysis, the predictability that goes with it. As somebody who's been going through her own life-changing healthcare experience, I hate the curve. I hate how it assumes that depression is inevitable. So I ignored it. I changed it. My healthcare experience looked something like this, and I'll tell you, I'll share with you how and why. But first things first. I wanted to meet someone very special to me. This is Bertha, my six-pound kidney tumor. At this stage, all the physicians in the room are lifting their heads up from the iPads and、um, <laughs> marveling at probably the largest renal angiomyeloma you've seen.、Um, it is 36 centimeters, 15 by 15 by 16. The size of a small baby, or、um, perhaps a football. I first found out about Bertha at a routine exam when the physician was doing palpation on my abdomen and said, "Maria, let's get an ultrasound." And we did, and then we got a CT, and then another one with contrast, and then the results came in, and then came the verdict: the tumor was too large. Too vascular, which was making and putting a significant risk on the possibility to embolize it, which is when they go in and block the blood vessels with the hope that the tumor will starve and die, or remove it surgically because it's so large and the risk of bleeding is significant. So I got another opinion, and I asked the same question, and they said, "Maria, this is unprecedented." The best we could do is try to remove it and save one of your kidneys, if you're lucky. So I took a step back, called a couple of friends. I called Daniel, I called Shauna, and I started asking questions. Questions like, before I did that, why, why me? I went into a comfortable place of denial. I was asymptomatic, young, relatively fit. I was going to Soul Cycle twice a week, and I was drinking kale juice. Couldn't possibly be happening to me. I didn't stay in, de in denial for long.、Um, I continued with the questions. So here's the questions I was actually asking back then:、um, How did this, this happen? Are there other tumors? How did it get so big? How am I even still functioning? And something very important happens when your mind goes from shock to curiosity. The brain chemistry changes. The curious mind is the best antidote against fear and self-destruction. The curious mind is also a creative mind. So I got curious about my tumor. I got to know my tumor. Yes, I named my tumor Bertha. I befriended her. I integrated in my life. I was still working full time, so I took her to business trips with me in Singapore and skiing in Chamonix, and I started talking and learning more about her. So here's what I found out: renal angiomyelomas are very common. They're typically associated with tuberous sclerosis, which is a genetic condition that's caused by two main、um, gene mutations: TSC1 and TSC2. Turns out, I don't have them. I got tested for them. Now, when you have a AML angiomyeloma and you don't have tuberous sclerosis, the physicians call you、um, 
this is, that this is not a, this is a sporadic AML. So we couldn't find out what caused Bertha, but as we were trying to study her, we found out that I had some special cysts around my lungs. That turns out that it's also a very, very rare condition. One in one million women worldwide have this, and call this sporadic. Typically, it's associated with a tuberous sclerosis gene, but if you don't have the gene, but yet you still have the cysts, you're in a, that sporadic category, which, as I learned, is medical term for heck if I know. So here I was, trying to learn about Bertha, collecting data, being in an outlier territory, and I learned two things. One, even though Bertha was a typical type of kidney tumor, there was nothing typical about her. She was giant, highly vascular, fatty mass that had taken over my entire right-hand side of my abdomen, completely dislodging all the other organs. And yet, she had done that for years, and she had done that somewhat gently and even respectfully. All my other organs were still functioning perfectly. I was asymptomatic, and somehow my body had found its own equilibrium and homeostasis. So I learned to appreciate that about her. If for some she was a ticking bomb, for me she was gentle and kind tumor. So with that mindset, I then continued to, to my second learning, which is when you're in a category of one, it's very easy to get lost and despair in the fact that there's no precedence, no literature, no best practices, no clinical protocols that you can turn to. But you could also take that as a way to say, this is my time to set the rules and create the standards and best practices. And it was with that mindset and with a lot of questions that I arrived at Exponential Medicine last year in November. I was catching up with Shafi, Shafi Ahmed, after his, his talk, and I shared about Bertha. Within 48 hours, I was overnighting my CD scans with the images from Mass General in Boston to the Del Coronado front desk. Shafi was looking at them, passing them on to a friend of his, Diego, a radiologist, also a fellow ex-med alum, who in turn took them on and then called a friend of his, who is a computational scientist working in a 3D printing and modeling lab in Mexico. So within a week, people were coming in suggesting ideas, and what used to be an isolated problem that had no place in medicine, was now an exciting momentum, a series of cascading miracles work building on top of each other, trying to curiously find a solution. Because of that momentum, we were able to 3D model Bertha. What you see here, the little brown piece, not the large brown, the small brown piece is my kidney. The large green piece is Bertha gentle Bertha, gently touching my other organs. What we found out from that modeling is that, in fact, she was touching many organs, could have done a lot of damage, but there was probably no likely connection between them. So what I did was I took that modeling, went back to my surgeons and said, what if, I know it's unprecedented, but what if we go in with the mindset, see what's in there, and try to remove her by sparing both my kidneys? Again, we had the conversation how risky the surgery was, how the uh, risk of bleeding on the, on the surgical table was enormous, perhaps too large, too, too high to even try. So I kept asking, what, what makes, in typical, in typical situations, how would we typically reduce the risk? Well, if the tumor was less than three centimeters, maybe we would have tried to embolize it. No one has tried full embolization at, 30, at a 36-centimeter tumor. So I questioned that assumption and found a radiologist who was curious enough to try. So we embolized Bertha um, about a year after we found out about her. The embolization was successful in the fact that she shrunk from 36 centimeters to 28 centimeters. Then we gave her a little bit of time, and then in March this year, 
we went in and removed her surgically. I got a beautiful scar. I got to keep both my kidneys. And Bertha got a farewell party. <laughs> so I came here with a personal story today because I think it's very important for us to, as we leave exponential medicine, and as we leave the magic of the art of the possible here, think about how we can activate the energy and continue on. I think about Bertha every day. When I go into a meeting and somebody says, Maria, this is unprecedented, it cannot be done, the best I can do is this, I turn into curiosity, I turn into empathy, I turn into asking the questions of what if and why not. I'm thankful to Bertha and I'm thankful for this community because I am here because of you. I'm a better patient. I'm a better leader for my team and for my organization because of Bertha. And so in my current role, Daniel and I are working on cultivating the energy and the intelligence of this exponential crowd. If you're up for it, you can reach, us to, uh, reach out to us. When we are ready to share, you'll hear from us. But my ask for you is personal. As you go back home and you find yourself in this room, when somebody asks you and tells you this has not been done before, think about the birth in your life, because this is going to determine whether your journey looks like this or looks like something else that you can create. Thank you.